Now it's my great pleasure to bring back to USD and to this program Norm Miller, who as you know was a, a full professor with us, uh, who's now Vice President of Analytics with the CoStar Group. But he also, we have a great working relationship with Norm, he also is, retains a title with USD, and that is as Distinguished Research Professor of Real Estate at the University of San Diego. He will introduce his good friend, uh, Stephen Rulak, who will take all of us for a spin around the world of real estate. Norm? Thanks, Mark. Mark said I already had more gray hair. I think he's right. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce a friend, advisor, a mentor to, uh, to me over the years. Um, Stephen Rulak holds more designations and degrees than anybody I know. He's got the CPA, he's got an MBA from Harvard, he's got a JD from UC Berkeley, he's got a PhD from Stanford. I think he also has a BS and an OMG from somewhere. Um, he now heads RULAC Global Places, a global strategy, financial, uh, economic advisory firm uh, that advises on significant real estate investment decisions. And he also is the chief investment strategist for uh, the RULAC Global Funds, which invest globally in real estate securities. Um, Stevens advised over 600 clients, 400 of whom are, are still in business. I'm kidding, that's, that's probably high. <laughs> With assets that were once over $50 billion. Stevens worked um, and traveled extensively. He, uh, he has a number of um, uh, operations down in India and uh, he's consulted in just about every country in the world. He's also a leading author and academic. He's been one of the leaders in the American Real Estate Society. Uh, where he's co-authored uh, more papers than you could possibly fit on a, on a normal resume. Um, he also is a professor at the University of Ulster, um, which explains why his language sounds a little bit more like Sam Zell nowadays. No, I'm kidding. I'm sure it's going to be a little bit, a little bit more subdued than, uh, than with Sam. But uh, we have his full resume, uh, not full resume, but an abbreviated bio in the um, program brochure. And at this point in time, it's my pleasure to welcome Stephen Rulak, my friend and advisor. Norm, thank you. It's really a pleasure to be in San Diego. And by uh, way of personal connection, my grandfather, who resided here for many years told me that he did a study of all the places around the world he might want to live. And he had two finalist candidates. One was the Mediterranean coast in France, and the other was San Diego. And so early on, I got exposed to San Diego and from my athletic involvements in running races coming down to uh, Balboa Park and enjoyed that, and then seeing my bicycling 1990 in uh, Masters Nationals were here, and looking at, can we get this on? Got the wrong one. We're supposed to start with the, okay, yeah, right here. I think bicycling gives us a very interesting metaphor. How many in the room here uh, either bicycle or follow bicycle racing? Okay. And of course, what's exciting is seeing Lance Armstrong coming back and uh, competing, going for number eight this year uh, with a team that's going to be Radio Shack, totally dedicated. It's going to be interesting to see how much of that technology they may use in some of the communications. But if you think of bicycle racing, how many people practice it, it's riding with a peloton. You're riding with a peloton, and it's very much a dicey, risky kind of situation. Who might prevail? Sometimes the strongest rider wins, oftentimes not. But if you break away, if you differentiate yourself, if you do something different than what others are doing, you have a much greater prospect of going forward. And I'm going to suggest to you today, we are not in an economy in which you want to ride with a peloton. We're not in an economy in which you want to ride with a peloton. 
to differentiate yourself, to break away, do something different, that's going to be the opportunity for very strong rewards. And developing these points a bit more, um, curious, how many of you know the artist George Surratt? Okay, fascinating. This is Sunday in the Park with George. And I would suggest if you look in the upper, upper panel there, that is somewhat analogous to thinking at just the property level, just looking at part of this particular painting. If you go down to the middle panel level, you're then seeing what might be the metro in which the prop, which a property operates. But to really understand what's going on, to make sense of the entire picture, you have to take everything in. And so we're suggesting if you take a bit broader perspective, look at things in a little bit larger context, you're going to have uh, perhaps better insights of what's going on. Now, I have to tell you, I'm going to cover a lot of material today, a lot that I'd like to get to, but we're not going to have time. And for those of you who want to get more, I have some information sent on your table. You have a chance to look at that. And we've heard prospects about you know, what might happen to the real estate markets and forecasts and so forth. One of the dilemmas is that a lot of people tend to think of things from a single dimensional perspective. And we suggest what you want to be looking at is an array of scenarios. This is our model of what we see happening in the market. We show back in 2000, peaked, coming down, and you have your optimistic mid-case, near worst, uh, worst case situation. Strongly urge you, do not make your plans on just one scenario. Don't make your plans on just one scenario. Consider an array of possible outcomes and position things accordingly. Now, extending this, just to give you in a sense, and sorry the light's not so strong in this, this shows one of the models we've done looking at the CMBS investing opportunities today as we perceive them. And we're looking at applying those four scenarios, running them through certain assumptions, how different DSCR LTV factors are going to apply and what that might mean. And just by perspective, green is good, red's not so good in terms of how that uh, might be going forward. Now, concept we would suggest you want to be keeping in mind, Albert Einstein, do not apply the same thinking that got you here. I think a lot of the commentaries you're seeing, people are essentially saying, well, where have we been? Where might we be going? Uh, we're going to be developing the idea the world is very, very different. Now, I'm just curious. Could I ask people to stand? How many people in this room were born in San Diego County? Would you stand? Born in San Diego County. OK. Thank you. All right. Now. Could I ask, how many people were not born in San Diego County? Would you stand? Wow. OK, thank you. Now, if you were running a real estate business, would you want to depend just on the people who were born in San Diego County? Pretty risky, right? A lot of you made a choice to come here for any number of reasons. And we're going to suggest that the critical consideration to be successful in the real estate business is to understand why do people make choices to go where they go, how do those choices create demand. And there are basically 10 critical place choices that people make that drive demand for real estate. Well, we'll, we'll see. And also, there are electronic fields you have to pass through as well. Uh, we've got the choice about where people want to live and work where they eat and meet, where they learn and play, where they shop, travel, worship, and prosper. Those 10 critical choices. And those are the demand drivers that dem create demand for property goods and services. And what you want to be doing is understanding how those forces are going on. And so something that's going to make it more appealing to live in a certain place will cause people to want to be living there, create demand for housing, apartments, and the like. And so it's an interplay of all of these particular elements. Now, as we look at this concept of place choice, one of the real fascinating challenges today is that people can do all kinds of things in many different places or no place at all in ways never before happening. And there's accelerating advances and changes going on. And we would suggest <laughs> sort of wonder, I don't hardly even want to move. Um, the considerations of traditional real estate versus the place strategy elements, 
which to a very large degree are substitutes, alternative ways of doing things in the real estate business. And we're going to suggest that you're in competition not just with the building in your competitive cohort or the apartment building down the street or the office building across town, but with the metros and other places and other worlds and various other ways of interacting with real estate. Now, one way of thinking of the real estate business is to consider it a game of filling boxes. Like if you're in retail business, you've got a store that's a box with a lot of boxes in that store of products you hope people come in and take out. And if you apply the, you know, what Rudyard Kipling said, this, you know, the honest serving men of when, where, which, why, what, how, those kinds of questions to boxes. And one thing we thought might be interesting here is let's, um, actually, no, we'll do that next. Let's pull up the, because uh, you, you all have these devices here. We're going to go through and pu pull some of these, uh, play up these, so get these ready to go. We're going to move a lot faster, though, in our questions than before. So you've, and all of you, of course, are highly, highly skilled with your PDAs, so your thumbs are very, very facile this morning, I'm sure. Uh, so let's get the, uh, the first question set up. Okay, and what I want to look at here is the size of spaces, the, the stuff you put in them. Are we going to be going into a world where you basically have more stuff in much larger places? So a more is much more environment, or it's going to be more stuff in bigger places, more is more, less stuff in bigger places, more spacious and less, connect, less crowded, more stuff in smaller spaces, same amount of stuff in same size places, less stuff in smaller places, or much less stuff in much smaller places. You're going to live really large or live smaller. Are you going to live spaciously or live crowded? So let's see what, uh, how are we doing on our count? Okay, everybody, anybody need any more time? Okay, let, let, let's show the results on that one. Interesting. Now, if we have less stuff in smaller places, what does that mean if you're in the retail business selling stuff? And what does that mean if you have a portfolio of bigger places? Now, it's going to be interesting. And this is going to vary tremendously by culture, by markets, by demographics. But it's something one to let's, let's go to the next question here. And moving this and talking about the social media question. And, what I want to do is get a sense of the room, how, much, how people are working with social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, MyPlace, blogs, Plaxo, YouTube, Delicious, StumbleBun, StumblePond, Dig, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so number one, not using social media and don't plan to do it. That'd be the first answer. Second, you're, now using, you're not now doing it, but you want to start doing it sometime. Next, you've started using it. Third, you're actively using it. You're actively using it and actually getting benefits that justify the time you're doing it. Maybe you're very active in social media, but you're not necessarily have gotten the benefits. And finally, uh, very active social media and getting a lot of benefits out of it. And so indicate where, where you'd be on, on these on a on one to seven basis. Okay, see the results. Interesting. Now, to some degree, these results reflect the demographics of this room. Okay? Maybe to a big degree. Now, if we had asked, because I think there are a number of people here who have children of a certain age, if we were to ask you what this response would be if you were answering for your children, would it be different? Okay? Now, if you have a longer time horizon, and you're thinking about who are going to be the tenants of my buildings in 10 years, or who's going to buy my houses in five or eight years, or who's going to shop in my places in so many years, might those numbers look slightly different? OK? All right, let's go on to the next question. 
The expansion of communications networks, knowledge networks, globalization will make real estate decisions substantially less critical and less important. So essentially this idea is there was a book out by Frances Karen Cross said Death of Distance, Economist Technology Writer about a decade ago. And she essentially said, well, distance isn't going to be very important. Distance is going to render physical environments less important, so it's not going to really matter much. So it's, with all these technology globalization, what's, what's that going to affect? Strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. Well, you, you're, you're fast, so let's put the results up on this one. So you're of the view that real estate will be more important. You got that one right. Okay, let's go to the next question. Will social media make your real estate business substantially more productive? Do you strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, or strongly disagree? How's it going to affect the productivity of your real estate business? Okay, let's see results on that. Can we put the results up? We don't need the clock because this is a smart group. They go fast. Okay, so you agree it's going to impact the productivity of the business. Now that's an interesting connection. If you, if you go back two slides ago, you said you're not going to use it, but it's going to impact your business. So I guess you're going to hire people who will use it for you. Okay, now let's go on to the next question. As well as social media advances, role in real estate and society and business will be substantially more important. So what, what's your vote on this one? we see the results? Interesting. So it seems like a mixed one. There's not strong consensus either way on this one. Okay, let's go to the next one in terms of, uh, because the social media and technology advances the place where many people physically live and the places where many people may work, would be more and more separated. What do we see happening on this? Okay, can we see the results? Okay, it's interesting, there's a polarization here. Now, would it be useful to know this about your target client in terms of how you would be positioning your property strategy and communicating what you're doing? Okay, let's go on to this next question about how, what you might emphasize in your investing decisions. And here what I want to describe, looking at different things. Deal analysis may be most important, market timing most important, portfolio diversification most important, policy and strategy most important, deal analysis and portfolio diversification equally important, or primarily you start out emphasizing policy and strategy, then secondarily portfolio diversification, and third, deal analysis. Very different approaches in terms of the style of how you'd be thinking about what, what's important and what drives your business. So describe which, uh, indicate which of those would be most, most descriptive of how you would approach it. Now, this particular question, a couple of others, I'm going to hold off putting the results up because we're going to actually come back and, and revisit these. So we're not going to put the results up on these immediately. Okay, so let's go on to the next question. Okay, well, that's not exactly where I want to go. Let's go back to me for now. Can we, can we hold, the, hold those questions and, and, come and defer on those for a moment? Okay, I don't want that slide up, please. So j just put the logo in. You need to put me up, because I know you want to see me on the screen some more. Um, now, it's interesting. Some people think that uh, real estate is somewhat like musical chairs. You know the game where music is playing and people are dancing around, and then you, and it stops, you want to be sure you're in a chair, and they keep taking the chairs off? Now, in, in fact, though, if you look at what happened in the last number of years, it seems that a lot of people thought that as the music was playing, instead of taking chairs off, they're putting more chairs back on the floor. And all of a sudden, all the chairs disappeared. Now, it's interesting. Do you remember the... Uh, 
former CEO of Citicorp, Charles Prince. You know, the guy who got a $100 billion sort of bonus leaving for, I don't know, how many billions of dollars in market value did, did, was destroyed under his leadership? But it was a very, very interesting comment, comment he made. As long as the music is playing, you've got to get up and dance. As long as the music is playing, you've got to get up and dance. And they said, the music is still playing, so I'm still dancing. Now, it's a very expensive dance card for the City, City Corp shareholders. And I'm curious, how many here have visited Versailles? Versailles. Fabulous place. It's interesting, you know, Louis XIV, who was the, say, the, the mega real estate developer behind Versailles, once commented that you should be very careful of trusting dancers and architects. Very careful in trusting dancers and architects. And what does it tell us about our economy and financial system if we have a dancing banker investing in financial architecture? Now, what does that tell us? Now, let's um, go back here. I want to come back to the slides again. One, one of the themes I want to talk to you about, thinking of how you view the real estate business, is to consider real estate in the context of the value chain. Basically, the property interest that you're involved with is a step along the way in an overall value chain. And many people in real estate tend to think of it just as a, a particular piece. And what we're suggesting, if you consider the value chain concept, you know, the supply chain of real estate delivery services, you can start out with a forest. From there, you would go off to take the, as you're harvesting that lo the, the logs and timber and so forth, go look at the timber product itself, then get into the lumber mill, then get into the distributor. You might be at Home Depot by this time or lumber yard and so forth. Then get it onto the job site and do the building. And there's a whole series of different economic relationships in terms of the, the customer, the supplier, the margins, the production economics, all of these factors. And then that goes on to a whole series of other elements. But by thinking of it from a value chain perspective and thinking of real, how real estate works, you may come up with very different ideas and insights to your business than you might if you think of it just as a monolithic single one. Now, let's go on and view a way to think about real estate on a broader perspective. And our, our particular view, if you think of investment, is just owning property. It's really quite narrow. We would basically describe the real estate business as having five categories. There's property ownership. In addition to that, you have the development services side, the development business, all the building and construction, suppliers, cement, steel, anything that's going to go in a building is an investment in the future of real estate. Then you have business services, anybody providing things for a fee, then you get into a category we call property resources or corporate real estate. Massive owners of real estate. Corporations own substantially more real estate than do any other category. And finally, we have a group of companies we call Place Strategy, which in this lower right corner here, as you recall the slide earlier we had up where we talked about, you saw images of FedEx and eBay and Amazon. Those are all real estate plays. Because to the extent you own a shopping center, you had a bookstore there, but the people don't need to go to that bookstore. They can go to Amazon and make that order. That's a very direct competitor to what you're doing. And to the extent you have people that can say, well, depend, instead of having just to go to work within a, an accessible commuting distance, we can now send our work to a very far away distant activity, distant place, so using FedEx. Or we'll just send it virtually by using a Cisco product or software of some sort, et cetera. Again, those are all real estate companies. So they're very much in the real estate business. And we would suggest a growing share of what's happening in real estate is controlled by so-called non-traditional real estate companies. Now, what's interesting out of this is that these companies, these five categories, investment, development, services, corporations own real estate, these innovative place strategies that are competing and, and complementing real estate, they have very different cyclic patterns over time. And so what may be good for one segment may be not so good for the other segment. 
And so as you start thinking of this from a portfolio effect, you can do things very, very differently. Now, one of the interesting phenomenon of uh, looking at the real estate business, looking at the investment business, is consider where is the payoff? You recall the question a few, a few moments back where we asked you, said you look more at deal analysis or portfolio diversification, you know, how do you, where's your emphasis? Here I'm sharing with you some very interesting research on how people make investing decisions. And there have been a number of studies around this, and the basic question is, what's the highest return on investment on analytic resources? And one thing I have to say, I was impressed in business school, not so much by what they did, but what they didn't do. And often, the gaps or what's not done is much more important than what actually is done. You know, what's missing may be more meaningful to you than what you actually see. Is there was a lot of discussion about return on investment, return, you know, finance, financial analysis calculations, dealing with tangible assets. Very little was done with human capital. Very little was done with the consideration of how much time is it going to take. You know, we, we learned all these fancy models, but it was treated as if one model that you could do in a minute was treated the same way as another one that would take a month to do. And so if you're going to look at how do you, how do you spend your time, where's the payoff? And if you look at this, on, you find that the majority of uh, people emphasize deal analysis. Secondarily, they look at how they take this deal and put together with that one and that one and construct their overall portfolio. And on a third level, they deal with a policy and strategy. And I'm going to suggest to you that most people have it in reverse order. And let's see, our graphics are not necessarily coming up here. The, uh, element which we want to show is if you look at your chart here under investing policy, the research allocation is just to the left of that line where the performance contribution is way to the right of the line. And the portfolio construction is about midway to the left of the line and the contribution about midway to the right. And deal analysis far to the left of the line in terms of allocation, contribution much less. And Let's see if on this other one we get the, yeah, here, this, this graphic shows the point. You basically see too much resources, disproportionate resources are spent in activities that are not that rewarding. And way too little resources are spent on what has the most reward to it. It's a value engineering concept applied to how you allocate your time. And the payoffs, again, we suggest, are going to higher orders of time. Now, let's go back and come back and have a few more questions here on our survey. And we want to talk about the impacts of globalization on how that's going to impact performance of business, real estate. We're going to do both commercial and residential. And so we'll get the next question up, please. OK. Growing globalization is going to impact business performance in the US and its profitability very positively, positively, neutral, negatively, or very negatively. And you heard some interesting comments. Sam Zell was talking about this. The prior panel had some very interesting observations about perspectives and different players. So will growing globalization affect US business performance and profitability uh, positively through negatively? OK, let's see results on that. OK, positive effect on that. OK, let's move on on US business performance. Let's see what that's going to mean for residential real estate? How will globalization affect residential real estate? Positively through very negatively. Let's see results there. OK, even, even stronger in residential. Now let's see what about commercial real estate. See results on that? OK, again, similar exiting. So people think globalization would be better for commercial than residential. That's interesting. As, um, there was a expression, I think a Quaker lady was asked about something she didn't 
but, and she very politely was expressing how she didn't agree with it. She said, I would have never thought to express it that way. Um, let's go on and look at the investing risk and rewards of globalization. Okay, see the results. Okay, very similar. Now maybe people are just hitting the same button. You know, sort of, but, uh, all right, now let's, let's, let's take these same series of questions and look at the new economy in terms of what, um, what things may, may mean as far as the uh, new economy. And we've, we've heard this talk about, again, basic same things, U.S. business performance and profitability. How's the new economy, the shifting structure of how the economy operates? How's that going to be affecting things? See results? Negatively, and, and sort of it, it's a mix, positive and negative. So again, split. Okay, now let's go on to see what that might mean for uh, residential real estate. What will the new economy mean for residential real estate? See results? Interesting. And let's see about com let's see what that means now for commercial real estate. See results. Great. So it's interesting the the global economy globalization can be positive. But new economy negative, okay? Um, and investing risks and rewards. See results? Very spread. Now, one interesting takeaway, and I want to spend some time analyzing these numbers a little bit later, but one of the takeaways is that there seems to be some divergence on any one question, and there's not necessarily a consistent pattern question to question, you know, cause and effect and sequence. Now, to me, on a policy base, say, well, geez, they aren't getting it so much. And then another basis, I say, there's a lot of opportunity in those different, different perceptions in terms of how you, how you position things, what you want to look at it. Now, let's move on and look at a, a question having to do with the impact of places absolute and relative performance. And the, in the prior panel, there were some commentaries about California issues, like some of our strategy work find people say, look, California is blacklisted as far as getting certain businesses to locate here, no matter how appealing our municipal story is, or how attractive our building is, if it's in California, it's just not going to get attention. Just, is that, now that's, well, but so we've got an understanding, how will we see real estate investments influenced by the competitors of places, social services, safety, and taxes? And I want to suggest we're looking at this not just in San Diego County, but on a global basis, because basically it places more and more in competition. So let's see what we see here on how that's going to be affected See the results on this? <laughs> I guess, can, we go, can we put that result back up quickly? Because I'm I not sure everybody got to see it. Okay. Strongly agree. Okay, let's look at one more question. What's real estate business in 2015 going to be like? Is comparison days. Can be profound and fundamental change, and these changes will be widely recognized or it's going to be profound fundamental change, but people will try to operate in a business in as usual manner. So it'll change a lot, but they won't necessarily be, be wanting to recognize it. Third, modest evolving change. Fourth, it's going to be same as before, not much change, but with more discipline and smarter, and smarter decisions. Some of you may have seen that movie before. And finally, same as before, not much change with cycles of excess and mistakes repeating. Yeah, how, how do you see the real estate business maybe be playing out? 
Okay. Um, we're going to come back before I show the results on, on this slide, because I want to come back and do it again. Um, but I'd like to get another slide up here. Okay, okay let's see. I'm sorry, the, the, the colors are not coming out on, on this one as well, but what we're showing here is the dominance of, of real estate in the U.S. economy from 1947 through 2007. And what's fascinating is in, what we've basically done is an input-output analysis of the entire economy, real estate activity, how it plays through. Because example, like um, that shirt you're wearing, you went to the store to get it, right? Or did you buy it online? Or? Got it at a store. Now, when you went to a store to get it there, you, did you interact with a, a, was it one of those unique stores that actually had helpful salespeople, or was it self-service, or? I, I, I chose by myself. You chose I by yourself. But there were salespeople you could have done there. Now, whether they helped you or not, you still paid their salary when you bought that shirt. True. And when you went to the checkout, you paid somebody else. And if you walk, walk all the way through, you're basically walking around wearing some real estate, right? In terms of the economic consequences. And so what we basically do is take every, transaction economy, run it back through. And we found if you go back right after the Second War, the economy, about 40% was real estate. Today it's over 50%. And the rapidly evolving developing countries that we do a lot of our investing in, it's up in the 55 approaching 60% range. And so very interesting elements. And one thing that doesn't show up as much here, you know what big factor that drives real estate being so much more in the economy? Financial services. Yeah, if you, do a, if you take apart the economics and numbers in a property, you're going to find the finance cost, the capital cost is a big factor. So let's go on. I want to show you quickly about some of the changes in employment, destroy real estate demand. And we, we've, we've tracked here basically the top 10 metros in the country. And that's a 20-year time horizon. You can't quite see so much. But one of the elements to look at that's very sobering is look at the demand, look at the job growth in the 1990s. And then look at it in the, 20th, in the first decade of the 20th, 21st century. You know, basically, it's about neutral. The jobs that were created have been subsequently lost. And it's also particularly notable is look at the job base that was created in the 1990s compared to where we were now. And then as you reflect on the President's State of the Union speech, night before last, big priority, where are those jobs going to come from? What's particularly interesting here is we do the same analysis then breaking it down by different sectors. And again, one of the things that comes out, tremendous variability and change. And finally, I want to show you here as we've tracked the growth of the real estate markets, top is assets, below is the debt composition over the last 60 years. And you see tremendous increase, but starting to come down. And so a lot of factors are underway. Now, one of the themes that we suggest is increasingly characteristic of our economy as a theme I'm describing as hyper discontinuity. Hyper discontinuity. And what we're suggesting is that the patterns that prevailed before are not necessarily reliable patterns in going forward. So what might have been before you cannot necessarily rely on going forward. And as example, tremendous change in technology. Tremendous change in technology. Values are moving a lot. The economic basis we've just seen. In politics, if you think back a couple of years ago, many people would have thought it would have been absolutely improbable that Barack Obama would be elected to the White House. And a year ago, it would have been a near certainty that there was no way that the Democratic Party could lose the Kennedy senator seat. A near certainty there's no way the Democratic Party would lose that seat. And it's interesting, you know, the Boston Tea Party, going back, the revelation in Boston, again, politics. You can't count on things. Let me just give you just a quick statistic on this. The period of the high point of Bank of America stock price from October 2007 to March 2009, it dropped 94%. 94% decline. And then from a low of March 2009 to the end of the year, it was up 380%. 
Yeah, Sam Zell, my friend, talked about the challenges to plan with shifting rules. But I would suggest the, how many sports fans? People follow basketball, football, okay. Now, do you follow basketball or, okay. Now, how would you like to plan a game where you understood that at any point in time, the coaches would shift sides and the referee would change to become a player. How would that affect your planning? Incredibly. That's not too different than where we are today. And I'm curious. Now, you, you, you look like you've had reasonable background in statistics and math and econometrics and so forth, right? Uh, some good, some real bad. OK, some good, some real bad. Now, I, do you like to go to the horse, play the horses at all? Or? Delmar, yeah. Delmar, okay, great. Now, what's the difference between picking the winner of one race as opposed to having to pick the, the winners in the entire race? Because you make a lot more money if you do the second one, right? Absolutely. And what are the differences in terms of how hard it is? The odds are astronomical. Astronomical, okay. Let's, let's go through society. Now, let's say that you've got a bet with a 90% probability, and there, there is a second event with 90%, then what's your cumulative probability going to be at that point? 9 by 9, 81, right? 81, okay. Now, if you do a third one and it takes you down, then what are you at? About 73%, right? 72. 72, 72.9, right. So you keep going through it. And if, is, are you seeing a pattern here? You get farther and farther away from 100% certainty as you add the number of events. Now, what happens if the odds drop from 90% to 80%? 10% less chance of succeeding. Less chance. So on the second time through, instead of being 81, 64, right? Correct. And is, is, is it going to sort of continue with that pattern, or will it be exponentially different over time? Exponentially different over so time. So it's going to grow and grow. So what happens in your business life, in your personal lives, is you have more choices, more variabilities, more uncertainty, and less likelihood of getting an out the outcome you want. Higher and higher risk. Now, we're getting to a point where, to you know, conclude shortly, I um, wanted to mention, because I have, a, you know, when they talked about the program, you know, I said, well, I'd be glad to take the whole four hours, and no, you only get 50 minutes, so. Uh, a lot more I could say. I, I included on the center of your tables here some of these uh, papers. If you want to learn more about it, we've got some um, elements in, in the spirit of uh, CMBS structure, which we do a lot. We have the uh, B tranche, uh, large A, single A tranche, triple A tranche, a different offer if you want. But I'd be glad to take some questions. We have a few more minutes here before the uh, next panel comes up. And there are points you'd like me to go into in, in more detail. Yes, sir. So I believe in deal analysis, but what is the role of market analysis? What is the proper, efficient role of market analysis? OK, the question is, believes in deal analysis, what's the role of proper, efficient market analysis as contrasted to the improper, inefficient kind, right? Um, OK, first off, deal analysis, I view, is a necessary but not a sufficient condition to making effective decisions. <laughs> and deal analysis follows from a market analysis realm. And just to put it in context, if we think of a CMBS investment analysis, just take, take on that, you'd be looking at a specific tranche in a CMBS deal, which in a partnership or syndication could be like the limited partnership position on that. But to understand that, you really need to understand the entire structure of the CMBS. You know, what are the relative priorities and circumstances of services, how all of that works. But then you have to understand what are the CMBS investing? It's investing in a portfolio of mortgages, right? And to do that, you have to look at what's in each individual mortgage. Each individual mortgage is secured by a property, so you have to be understanding all the properties and that they're in markets and influenced by what happens in that market. And then you go beyond that and say, well, if they're going to be in the market, who's going to be in that, who's going to actually pay rent for that building? Or how are you going to, who's going to be the individual? And how much money are they going to make? What are they going to pay in rent? Or if it's a company and do that. And you have to say, if the company's got a viable business model, and it's great to say you've got this individual working here and maybe that, but will they have a job? Can they make enough money in the job? And one of the big challenges we have, as the president mentioned in his job pro program, uh, the country has a fundamental challenge 
to be able to create job opportunities or create training and knowledge that can be globally competitive. And so on a market basis, I'm going to tell you, I, I moved all of our analytic, the mass majority of our analytic work to India in 2000. Because I can basically get smarter people at much more advantageous economic terms with a lot of cultural advantages in running a business than I could in, in, in a lot of other, other places. And so ultimately on a market analysis element, the markets you want to analyze are at multiple levels of place. You want to analyze a country in terms of region of country, state, region of state, metro, your neighborhood, all of that. I mean, we, we basically have a 17 level framework of how you look at that. So market analysis is absolutely fundamental. Totally necessary, but not sufficient. There's some other factors. They have to say what drives all that. Yes. Yes. You mentioned a number of cross-cutting currents that affect real estate, social media, globalization, regulation, taxes. How do you weight these different factors in terms of uh, coming up with a net uh, effect? Well, the, the question is a number of cross-currents of uh, technology and taxes and competitive elements and so forth. Uh, the way we look at it, we have models that operate at multiple levels of place on a global basis of country competition, state competition, metro competition. We have multiple hundreds of variables in those models. All of that's converted and analyzed. We basically come down and so then we have a relative assessment of the probable performance of a particular place in terms of the basic competitiveness and appeal of that place. And that, that's a, a way, and I, I would mention, um, you know, on, on here we, we mentioned our, our portfolio model. Uh, you know, that, that's something people can get access to that's a way of, of factoring all of that in. But the analytics are much more complex than many people have been approaching them. And I think the, the back of the envelope intuitive approach is very, very appropriate to the extent you have high confidence tomorrow's going to be like yesterday. But if you think it's going to vary a little bit, then you may want to be taking more factors into account. Let's see, one, one thing I'd, I'd like to do, which on the, on the place choice element, I'm wondering, who here was the recipient of a very romantic wedding proposal? Because I was, oh, sorry, is that, anybody? Am I going to have to pick some? OK. Never, I'll, I'll maybe I'll just volunteer someone. Uh, <laughs> what? Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Can can sure. can you sure. now? Did w could you tell us where this happened? Sure. Um, if you've ever been to Yosemite, I've been to Yosemite. Half dome. Half dome. Top of the mountain. Top of the mountain. In a snowstorm. In a snowstorm. Six inches of snow. Up at the top, uh, very romantic. Now, did so. that did that place influence the experience for you? Oh yes, totally. And is it, yes. is it um, did you know this was going to happen in advance? I had a I had a good feeling that would happen. Yes. So you were hopeful, optimistic. Yes, I was. Okay, and so did the anticipation of the place setting influence how you approach this? Yes. And the snow was the surprise, though. Okay. Because down below it was raining, and Snow made everything so much more beautiful. More romantic. Hopefully and, this illustrates you know, your point. It does. Okay. Now, do, do you... This uh, was not planned. <laughs> did, and, and, and thinking back on that, is that a, a very important memory in your life? We went back almost every year with each one of our succeeding children and showed them the place where we got Drug engaged. them up the mountain through the snow and... <laughs> yes. So... It's fair to say that place factors are very important in your life. And would you suggest that sensitivity to place may influence how you do other things, how you decide where you want to shop, where you want to live, where you might want to work? Yes. Where you'd study, where, where you would go to school, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. A concluding comment is that we are in a society, if you look at very fascinating uh, data you said about you know, we're going to have bigger stuff and smaller boxes and more and more and all of that. We're in a time that people probably have enough stuff. Some people have a lot more stuff than they want. And we're going more and more to an experience realm. To the extent you can package experience in your property goods and services offers, you're going to be in a much more competitive position than those who don't. 
Really enjoyed being with you. I'm looking forward to uh, the next panel about learning some of those opportunities. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah.